So welcome everyone to the fifth annual digital competition hosted by ERISA and the Vanguard Cabinet. The Vanguard Cabinet is an advisory board within ERISA that is made up of young professionals working to engage young practitioners, promote their participation in the organization, and better understand the concerns facing these future leaders of the geospatial community. Along with coordinating and promoting events like these in conjunction with ERISA's annual GIS Pro Conference, we are responsible for launching and maintaining the Mentoring Network Program, as well as outreach and engagement on various social media channels. The purpose of this competition is to promote the GIS profession and attendance of young and emerging professionals at the GIS Pro 2021 Conference in Baltimore, Maryland on October 3rd through the 6th, 2021. The finalists that will present today will be awarded a one-year ERISA membership and the top three presenters selected by our esteemed panel of judges will be awarded a full GIS Pro registration, a $500 travel stipend, and the opportunity to present their work live at GIS Pro 2021 in Baltimore. The competition was limited to projects that utilize web and mobile platforms, such as ArcGIS Online, Tableau, Mapbox, or Power BI. Projects should showcase the visualization functions of these platforms while also demonstrating knowledge and proficiency in spatial analytics, cartographic design, and or geospatial techniques. So first, before we get started, I would like to introduce our panel of judges. First, we have Kevin Mickey. He is the current president of ERISA, the Director of Professional Development and Geospatial Technologies Education at the Pola Center, an Applied Research Center um, in the IUPUI School of Informatics and Computing. His experience includes directing and supporting projects involving the creation of geospatial tools and workflows, as well as conducting analysis related to natural hazard risk. He also has designed, managed, and instructed courses in introductory through advanced GIS topics, including multiple courses on natural hazard risk management. Next, we have Matt Garricky. Dr. Matt Garricky, GISP, is a geospatial program manager with Virginia's 911 and Geospatial Services Bureau, focusing on GIS and next generation 911 and supporting local governments and PSAPSs across the Commonwealth. He has managed GIS offices and projects in local government, worked with the state level GIS clearinghouses and data development projects, and has taught GIS, mapping, and geography courses at several colleges and universities. Matt works with ERISA's Professional Education Committee and Next Generation 911 Task Force and contributes to National Emergency Number Association work groups relating to GIS. Last but not least, we have Mer Meredith DiMatina. Meredith serves as a GIS specialist for the UNCG Center for Housing and Community Studies and the Burlington Police Department. Her work focuses on the spatial data and analysis used to evaluate barriers to healthy and safe communities. She has participated in ERISA's Vanguard Cabinet for the past three years and enjoys connecting with others in the GIS community. So our contestants, um, if you will look in the chat box, I am about to place the order in which you will present. So first we have Andrew Pinda, um, and each person will have five minutes for their presentation followed by a few minutes for questions from the judges or audience. After the competition, the judges will confer and announce the winners by August 31st. Okay, cool. So I think everyone should be able to see my screen. Yes, it looks good. Okay, cool. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to present and talk to you a little bit about the benefits of trees. Um, so I recently graduated from Cal State University's GIS Science Master's Program, um, and I work full-time as an arborist um, for a company called West Coast Arborist out of California. And specifically, I work with uh, tree inventory data, tree canopy cover, things of that nature. So naturally, one of the projects I kind of gravitated towards at school was looking at Cal State Long Beach's existing tree inventory and seeing how you can quantify the benefits of a tree inventory to the community, to decision makers, to various stakeholders. Um, that way they can not only see that trees do have an aesthetic benefit, but that way you can quantify and monetize the value of all the trees in the urban forest, um, in this case, specific to Long Beach's campus. Uh, so for my project, and what I'm gonna be presenting to you today is this ArcGIS hub page. 
So it's not just one map, it's a series of multiple maps. There's a dashboard, there's a web map, and there's also a campus scene. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about what each individual project looks like and how we can navigate it in some of the bells and whistles of each. So from the landing page, you can see there's a little description about the project, what it's about, and the tools that were used to analyze it. So this was built in ArcGIS's hub page. And what we're doing is we're quantifying the benefits of Cal State Long Beach's urban forest. So they have a complete tree inventory, which means each of the trees on campus was individually assessed. Uh, species information was uh, captured, the DBH, height, so on and so forth, various attributes about each individual tree. And once that information is collected, you can run it through a program called iTree. Um, and that's a program developed by USDA Forest Service designed to quantify the ecosystem, services, structural, um, all sorts of benefits related to trees. So at a glance from the landing page, you can see there's 183 unique species, 7,400 trees, and the structural value of over 14 million. So these are really convincing numbers because when you're expressing this and showing this to stakeholders, decision makers, board members, you can actually say, hey, look, we're managing an asset worth over $14.5 million, so we need to uh, maintain it, we need to do right tree, right place, um, keep planting the urban forest, things of that nature. So here's some of the environmental benefits at a glance. You can see how much carbon is sequestered per year, pollution removal, avoided runoff, so on and so forth. Uh, it gives you units based on the benefit, and then it also gives you a monetary value per year. So specific to maps, there's three different maps and I'm gonna to quickly touch over each of them. You have the tree benefits dashboard, uh, tree benefits web map, and then the 3D buildings and scene. So here in the web map, um, it has a full tree inventory. And as you zoom in and out to certain parts of campus, you see all these widgets quantifying the ecosystem services of the trees displayed on the map update. And then the nice thing about this is it has all the bells and whistles and widgets that you can ask for. You can select a certain group of tree sites and then all the results will benefit based on that. So it's a nice neat little tool for the community to click on and explore and navigate and see um, how the campus benefits from these trees change depending on what part of the campus you're on. And there's also an additional filter over here where you can search by DBH height or any sort of species. So. That's one nice little dashboard. Another one, here's this web map. There's a couple different features on this map. So I have a couple layers show, showing. Um, I have the tree inventory layer. So here's where you can get specific information about individual trees and see the environmental benefits, structural benefits, um, ecosystem services, things of that nature. Uh, this was all scripted out in Arcade. So I'm gonna turn that layer off. Over here in the layer list, you can see there's heat maps for all these various sorts of environmental services. So same thing, it's another tool to help visualize where the benefits are on campus. So here I just have heat map, gross carbon sequestration per year. You can see what parts of the campus are sequestering more carbon versus which ones aren't. Uh, and that way you can use this for any climate adaptation plans, um, climate action plans, things of that nature to help assess where you want to plant trees and where you can potentially plant more trees. Um, and then just a little tree canopy cover layer so you can see how carbon sequestration relates to tree canopy cover. And then you can use the swipe layer to toggle on and off and search various layers and explore that. Uh, the last little map I'm going to go over or the last little scene I'm going to go over um, is a tool that's really powerful in not only visualizing right tree, right place, but quantifying the ecosystem services for trees. So if you plant in the right tree in the right place, depending on the time of year, you can get cooling and heating benefits from those trees planted. So I'm gonna call your attention to these trees right here. Uh, I changed this to today's date, where in Southern California, it's always warm weather. We can always benefit from a tree shading a building to reduce cooling costs. And the nice thing about this is once it's imported in this scene, you can see that if it's a, uh, um, depending on the type of tree, if it's deciduous evergreen and it's planted in the right place, you can see how in the afternoon during the hottest hours of the day, 
these trees actually begin to shade the building and therefore reduce any cooling costs that you would. And if they're deciduous trees, it'll have the opposite effect. In the winter months, it'll let sun pass through the trees and heat the building. So you can see how the daylight, depending on the time of year, impacts the building for the current state of the urban forest. Um, so those are these three web maps here. And then down here is just a little FAQ related to this tree inventory. So top 10 species on campus, a few of the mental physical health benefits provided to trees, how can our community or how does trees benefit our communities, so on and so forth. Um, and then a little bit about the information, kind of your, your metadata, where, where the data was gathered, what it was done, post-processing, cleanup, all of that good stuff. Um, so I think I went a little bit over time, but um, that's what I have. So thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Does anyone have any questions? Hi, Andrew. Thanks for your, your presentation. Um, so you, you did the data already exist or did you have to do any part of the, the tree inventory to, to collect the data points as part of your project? Yeah, good question. So there was an existing an existing partial inventory done by a vendor that previously completed the campus inventory, um, but there was construction and some updating that needed to be done. So I did the updating, some new collection, and then some random uh, quality check and quality assurance. Okay, and then my, my second question are, uh, is the, are all of the other layers and ecosystem benefits figures that you use in the map or showed in the dashboard, is that all outputs of iTrees? Or did you do any additional uh, analysis to help come up with any of those statistics or to create, uh, create other map layers that you're displaying? So it's a combination of both. The hard numbers, such as the ones being displayed here, these are all direct outputs of iTreeco. So you feed it in a tree inventory with a certain set of attributes, and then it spits out these numbers per tree. Um, so then I just cleaned that up, kind of made it in units that were understandable, and then mapped that here. Uh, and then other layers were created. Uh, this web scene was created using um, LIDAR LA County's Regional Image Consortium. They have LIDAR data that's public, made publicly available. So I did a couple of different deep learning tools to extract building footprints and then recreate these buildings and um, use some preset features for these trees. Thank you. Andrew, this is Kevin Mickey. I'm curious, have you had an opportunity to show this to stakeholders that might benefit this and how how they've reacted? I haven't, and they're, um, so I worked closely with the facilities department um, and the geography department at Cal State Long Beach. And there was definitely some interest in how we can promote these tools and spread it to the community to so where they can click around, explore and actually visualize these benefits. So that's kind of where the conversation is at now, um, but we're looking to eventually, or hopefully incorporate this into those climate action sort of plans and future plannings for campus and for future tree plantings. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? All right, thank you, Andrew. Michelle, there's oh, one in the chat. Um, there's one question in the chat from Robert. Uh, so see Robert's question was that city engine used at the end. So that was a web scene. Um, I didn't use city engine just because of uh, time constraints, but the same file formats can be used on both as far as, or, or as far as I know when the project was completed. Thank you. Um, so next off we have Alex Yumba. Would you like to present or share your screen now? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Okay. 
I hope everyone can see my screen. Uh, yes, we can. Okay. Um, so my name is Alex Yumbu. I'm a graduate student at the University of Cape Town. I completed my undergraduate studies last year and I worked on this project where I analyzed the vertical accuracy of um, four open source digital television models over Kenya. And yeah, this is what I'll be going through in this representation. Um, so um, I'm sure in your working with DEMs, you have come across, um, in your working with GIS, sorry, you come across DEMs, which is a digital television model. And what our DM basically does, it um, represents the terrain um, mathematically in form of a model. And DEMs are used in a variety of sectors in day-to-day -day GIS applications and others, for example, engineering. So in engineering, it can be used in pre and post analysis so that it um, reduces cost and time in terms of planning for engineering um, capabilities, for example, building roads and buildings. So if you want to know what, for example, cut or fill, you might need to um, bring or remove from your, your site, you can work with a DEM in hydrological models as well. DMs are being used in planning of cities, settlements, and so on and so forth. So there exists a variety of DMs, both open source and commercial, but the um, accuracy has always been a bone of contention. And that's why I chose to do this study for my undergraduate studies. So prior to this study, my supervisor, Dr. Odera, worked with um, another researcher known as Kabugi, where they assessed the vertical accuracy of shuttle radar topography DM, the 90 meters spatial resolution one, and ASTA over Nairobi County. So my study um, extends the study area to the whole of Kenya, but also includes um, Aloswald 3D DEM, as, as well as shuttle radar topography mission, the DEM that's um, 30 meters, so this, when the spatial resolution is 30 meters. So this is the methodology that I used. Um, so I got the individual DEMs from the various um, institutes. So from the United States Geological Survey, I got SRTM, the 30 meter spatial resolution one. From open topography, I sourced Alos World 3D DEM. And from the consultative group of international and agricultural research, they have a consortium for spatial information. I sourced SRTM from that and ASTA. I got ASTA from the uh, Japanese space systems. So um, I downloaded the tiles and since the study area was large, I had to stitch the tiles together in form of creating a mosaic and clipping it so that it fits the study area and then um, extracting the elevation values um, um, using add surface information. Okay, um, also I compared the extracted elevation values from the DMs to trigonometric stations that I sourced from the survey of Kenya, which is the survey institute back in Kenya. And using those elevation values from the trig beacons and the DMs, I conducted statistical analysis um, I developed a polynomial to try and model the differences. And after applying the polynomial, I conducted statistical analysis to determine if the polynomial either degraded the accuracy or improved the accuracy. Okay. Um, so 65 trigonometric stations were used in this study. I'll show you the 65 trigonometric beacons here. So. Um, this, uh, this is the distribution of the trigonometric stations over Kenya. And once you click on it, you can see the pop-up. It shows you the trig ID, which is the name of the trigonometric beacon, um, the geodetic curvilinear coordinates or the geographic coordinates, and it also shows you the orthometric height. So once the trigonometric beacons were surveyed, they were surveyed using G GNSS or GPS, and GPS measures um, ellipsoidal height instead of measuring um, 
orthometric height. So I had to reduce the height to orthometric height by subtracting the geoid ellipsoid undulation in order to determine the orthometric height, which we were going to use to assess the accuracy of the various DEMs. So the first one was Alos World 3D DEM, as you can see. Since ArcGIS Online um, doesn't support rasters, I had to convert the raster to a web map and bring it in as a background image. Unfortunately, as a result, I lost the attribute information, but the green areas, as you can see, are the low lying areas, followed by the yellowish, orangish areas, and then the purple areas and the white areas are the highest areas of the region of high elevation. As you can see here, you can see here the autometric height is 257.22 meters. Well, when you go to the high areas, you can see that the autometric height is 2,062.87 meters. So the, the um, autometric height or the DEM models the height as shown with the green areas being the low lying areas, the orange areas being the um, second least low lying areas and the purple and um, whitish areas are the areas of high elevation. So as you hey, can Alex, see, sorry. I apologize for interrupting you. Um, we are not able to see a map. It's still showing your statistical analysis page. Okay. Sorry about that. Let me try. Okay. Also, you can have you, about can one you minute left. Okay. Yes, we can see it now. Yeah, so what the map shows, it just shows the autometric height as well as the DM extracted height. And it shows the elevation difference between um, the Alos World 3D DM extracted height as well as the tr trigonometric beacon height. SRTM um, does the same thing as well. As you can see, if I make the map bigger, you'll be able to see the autometric height and the DM extracted height. And I was able to find the height difference as shown. With ASTA as well, same thing. If you click on the pop-up, the pop-up should be able to show you the autometric height and the DM extracted height, as well as the height difference for each and every trigonometric beacon. Um, I also generated a statistical plot um, based on the height differences of the for digital elevation models. As, as you can see, those point there and that point there indicates outliers. And I had to determine the outliers so that I can take them out. But before I took out the outliers, you can see the number of points are 65 points. And these are the statistics that I generated from the height differences. You can see the standard deviations are huge. And that is because of the outliers. Once, we, once I determined the outliers as seen there, you can see that is one of the outlier with massive height differences, as well as the other one. And now the statistical um, factors reduced. You can see that the mean, as well as the standard deviation reduced. So ALOS World 3 DDM performs the best out of the four DEMs and ASTA, the 90 meter one, performs the worst. I also did um, used uh, the trigonometric beacons to um, compute a polynomial and apply it to try and smooth out the errors. So the points in purple or the points in purple are used to um, generate the poly polynomial, while the points in yellow are used to test out the polynomial. So two thirds of the trigonometric beacons were used to test out to develop the polynomial. Sorry, and the rest, the resulting twenty-one points were used to test out if the polynomial will reduce or improve the accuracy. And the pol polynomials that were developed are as shown with X representing the mean of the height differences and phi representing the latitude and lambda representing the longitude. And I used least squares to try and solve for the coefficients which are from M naught to M nine. And these are the results obtained. You can see that the 21 points were used to um, to test out the polynomial, but you can see that the polynomial, um, instead of improving the accuracy, it did actually degrade the accuracy. But the mean values did 
improve. As you can see for us, it moved from 10 to one meter, from AWD from two to 0 0.3 meters and SRTM from three to 0 0.5 and the 91 from 9.8 to 1.6587. The second order polynomial as well, degraded the accuracy as can be seen in this table and um, the third order polynomial as well. That's the table there. And then I analyzed the elevation and slope analysis for each of the following DMs. And as you can see, I ranked um, the DMs in from low lying areas to high lying areas and computed the statistics as shown. And just like in the previous analysis, AWD performed better in relation to the rest. Okay, this, this, this is just the statistical analysis until we end as well. And I think I'm out of time, so I think we'll stop there unless there are any questions. Thank you, Alex. Are there any questions? So, with uh, with your results and analysis, um, I, I, I understand that that your project was trying to uh, assess the quality of the different elevation models. Uh, but if if I was doing a project and I had to use a digital elevation model for Kenya, uh, which one of these elevation models uh, would you recommend uh, for bare earth terrain modeling? Um, so the model that performed the best in each of the analysis was the AW3D, so the Advanced Land Observation Satellite World Elevation Model. It performed the best um, when I analyzed the four digital elevation models. Thank you. We have any more questions? All right, thank you, Alex. So next up we have Mirage. Would you like to share your screen? Yes, ma'am. All right, we can see it. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, respected judges and uh, worthy opponents. I am Virat Manish Shah, pursuing masters in geoinformatics from SEPT University. This was an individual project as a part of our second semester studio. GI the studio GIS for governance. This analysis, emergency service response for terror attack bomb blast will connect you with a real life scenario, whether emergency services of your city are robust enough to provide you immediate or quick response on time. Emergency service response for terror attack bomb blast in Gandhi Nagar. So what is a man-made hazard? The activity that has been done by the human, which may cause loss of life, injury or property damage, social and economical disruption. What is the vulnerability? Vulnerability is the characteristics and circumstances of an uh, individual community or a system which, which may be susceptible to be damaged because of an hazard. Emergency services response. What are emergency services? The emergency services are public organizations. Why are emergency services? to handle the situation, which can provide quick response to reduce the damage. How? Quickest response provided by the critical services. 
so aim understanding the understanding the existing emergency response time of the gandhinagar municipal corporation and performing uh, special analysis uh, techniques which can provide gis based solutions uh, to the emergency services to respond on time in case of bomb blast objectives identifying the vulnerable sectors in case of bomb blast analyzing the response of emergency services based on time at bomb blast locations site suitability for fire station will provide a robust and quick response of fire services tool for mitigation and response methodology population density land use land cover public of public and commercials of target transportation and commercials of target considering all the six parameters and using analytical hierarchy process and then weighted overlay tool is used to identify the vulnerable sectors to bomb blast then hypothetically considering bomb blast in very high vulnerable sector and then analyzing emergency service response based on time at bomb blast location site suitability for fire station mitigation and response tool for bomb blast so past incidents in gandhinagar on 24th september 2002 two armed men attacked the swami narayan akshadham temple so why this terrorist attacks are happening majority of the terrorist attacks are not random but they are carefully planned to increase the number of casualties and to create damage where this terrorist attacks can occur terrorist targets have shown that there is uh, targets those public spaces where maximum number of people can congregate at what time this terrorist attacks can occur there is targets location based on time at different time different location maximum number of people can gather so what are soft targets soft targets is locations that are accessible to general public and relatively unprotected making vulnerable to terrorist attacks so population the main aim of the terrorist attacks is to increase the number of casualties among population transportation soft target terrorist targets this railway station and bus stops where there is low security where there is no security and maximum number of people gather at at a time and to plant a bomb would be very easy because of this no security commercial soft target there is targets malls theaters hotels where security is less and maximum number of people gather at a time mostly on the weekends maximum number of people gather at this location so land use land cover a major uh, major number of the bomb blast has occurred in commercial and institutional zones where people can congregate as compared to residential gandhi uh, governmental soft target being gandhinagar a capital city of gujarat by uh, 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 vip such as chief minister prime minister of india and their political members come here and meet that's why this government offices have higher chance of being attacked public of target from past incidents all over the world terrorist targets this public locations where security is less and tourist places hospitals schools markets are highly vulnerable locations as maximum number of the bomb blast has occurred in in these places in india so considering all the six parameters in analytical hierarchy process and using weighted overlay tool to identify the vulnerable sectors in gandhinagar so here in this map you can see that sector number 10 is highly vulnerable to bomb blast and then soft targets in very high vulnerable sector in sector number 10 important government offices such as gujarat vidhan sabha public locations such as state state central library and transportation transportation locations such as bus stops are present in this location so directly these locations are directly vulnerable to bomb blast bomb blast impacted area gujarat vidhan sabha is a landmark of sector number 10 which is directly vulnerable to bomb blast where chief minister and prime minister of india visit despite of having high security most import targeting the most important person of the country will make it more vulnerable considering hypothetical bomb blast of high intensity at gujarat vidhan sabha which can impact its surrounding up to 1000 meters 
So here in this map, you can see Vidhan Sabha bomb blast intensity from here up to uh, is from here up to it is high, then it is medium, and then it is low. Time based uh, response of emergency services after bomb blast at Vidhan Sabha. So response time for any emergency service is minimum five minutes to maximum ten minutes. Emergency response time of police services. So uh, service area based on time of network analysis is used here. So here you can see green color represents the five minutes cut off time. Orange color represents 10, 10 minutes cut off time. 15 color represents, uh, uh, red color represents 15 minutes cut off time. So here you can see this uh, police services of Gandhinagar can reach on 10 minute cut off time at Vidhan Sabha location to get situation under control after bomb blast. Fire, uh, emergency response time for fire services. Fire services of Gandhinagar can reach on time at Vidhan Sabha to save lives and reduce damage to building caused by the bomb blast. As here in this map, you can see this, uh, fire services are able to reach on cutoff time of 10 minutes. Emergency response time of medical services. Medical services of Gandhinagar are, are able to reach, uh, reach on the cutoff time of 10 minutes. Here in this map, you can see at Gujarat Vidhan Sabha to take, to take injured people to nearby hospital after bomb blast. So after all this analysis, the main is Gandhinagar is a planned city in which all the emergency services can reach on time at Vidhan Sabha after the bomb blast. Now main point is existing fire stationing bomb blast impacted area. Depending upon the intensity of the bomb blast, it can be high or low. Existing fire station comes under the bomb blast impacted area. So what if the existing fire station will be damaged due to bomb blast or not able to operate? So service area analysis of existing fire station. Here in this map, you can see the existing fire services is not able to reach the maximum number of sectors then how it will able to provide a response to emergency services on time to all sectors. Do one fire station in Gandhinagar is enough. Suitable locations for fire station. multi criteria decision analysis for fire station. Vacant land, major roads, vulnerable sectors, building density, past fire incidents. Considering all the six parameters and using analytical hierarchy process and weighted overlay tool is used to identify suitable locations for fire station. Here in this map, you can see a green color indicates the suitable locations for fire station and red color indicates the not suitable locations for fire station. So mitigation and response tool for uh, bomb blast. Sorry. In this tool, the user needs to input in any point location and mention the distance of the area where bomb blast has impacted. So this tool was created with the help of Python by the use of the Python. And this tool will create a buffer of the impacted area of the bomb blast and will give routes from nearby medical, fire and police services to bomb blast spot. This tool will help emergency services to provide quick response on time. Inferences. Uh, uh, weighted, uh, weighted overlay tool will help to identify very high vulnerable sector to bomb blast in Gandhinagar. In India, places such as schools, malls, bus stops, service station, which can be a possible soft targets, their security need should be increased. Analyzing the current response time of emergency services. It's better to check these emergency services are capable enough to provide immediate response in immediate time. One second. Hmm. Uh, third, site suitability for new fire station will provide immediate response on time and robust fire services to all citizens of Gandhinagar. Fourth is tool for mitigation and response, which will help Gandhinagar Municipal Corporation to provide the routes to bomb blast incident locations from nearby emergency services. So conclusion, Gandhinagar is a planned city. Even though there are there was a terrorist attacks 
in swaminarayan akshadham temple on 24 september this analysis will help gandhinagar municipal corporation to increase the security at potential soft targets and vulnerable sectors will help to identify which sector uh, sector is directly vulnerable to bomb blast and analyzing response time of emergency services after bomb blast to reach bomb blast locations and the site suitability for new fire station will help help to make more resilient gandhinagar a capital city of gujarat india references uh, thank you for thank you for giving giving me this opportunity thank you varan good afternoon everyone uh, i'll be assisting with moderating going forward and now i'll open the floor for questions any questions for varan Varaj, this is Kevin Mickey. Um, can you talk to us about whether there was any presentation of the information that you developed in a web-based tool? I may have missed that. Varaj, did you catch the question? I believe you are sharing. Maraj, can you hear us? Josiah, I can put that question in the chat if you'd like. Ye yes, that would be great, Kevin. Thank you. And any other questions? Maraj, can you? Oh, I think. Maraj... Aray, but actually, I'm. Uh, sir, ko bol, we will connect again. Uska net chala gaya hai. Because I'm not able to open it. I'm not able to open it. I'm not sure. Kevin, maybe you can just post it in the, uh, thank you, Raj, um, Kevin posted the question in chat if you want to go ahead and, and respond to that as time permits, and maybe we can get going with the next presentation. Okay. Thanks, Josiah. No problem. All right, so um, up next, I'd like to introduce Aaron Osowski. Um, apologies if I got anything uh, mispronounced, then, you know, you can reintroduce yourself. So Aaron, would you like to share? Um, and a reminder, presenters, it's five minutes. I will send a notification if you are going over time or, you know, one minute before. So try to uh, be mindful and look out for that notification. Thank you. You can and proceed. Thanks, Josiah. And you did pronounce my last name correctly. I appreciate that. <laughs> okay. um, so I want to thank the Vanguard cabinet for giving me the opportunity to present here today. Uh, my name is Aaron Osowski. Um, let me get this in slideshow. Um, so my, my project focuses on analyzing trends of far-right groups immediately before and during the Trump administration of 2016 to 2019. So the presentation today is adapted from an original long-form uh, narrative version that I created in an Esri story maps post. So I concentrated the scope of my research on groups with one of these far-right ideologies listed. Um, that'd be right here. These uh, ideological um, uh, classifications were given from the Southern Poverty Law Center. Uh, that's also who I obtained all of the data from that you see here. Um, so I also shed a spotlight on both the rise of newer and younger white nationalist organizations, as well as the growth of the Proud Boys organization. And like I mentioned before, all of this data is from the SPLC's hate map project, um, which is some publicly available data online. So this first map shows the explosion in far right organizations who have a nationwide presence of at least five or more chapters. I wanted it to limit it to groups that had at least some broad reach, so I limited it to a minimum of five nationwide chapters. So what the data show is that from 2016 to 2019, the number of groups with five or more chapters rose from seven in 2016, 
that'd be the yellow dots you see there. Seven organizations that have at least five branches to 20 branches uh, by 2019. So you can really see the expansion uh, of, of groups across the country from the kind of Appalachia, Mideast and East Coast out into really all corners of the country, uh, especially the Midwest, Southeast and Northeast. So here's a few notable trends of some of the top groups during these four years. Two main takeaways from these six groups that I focus on. One is the quick ascendancy of these white identity groups such as the Proud Boys and Patriot Front that either didn't exist or have very little group membership um, on or before 2016. Uh, the Proud Boys and the Patriot Front being those two organizations. Um, we also see a corresponding decline of traditional white supremacist groups who are aligned with the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, there are official and unofficial groups who are associated with the KKK. Um, the SPLC puts any of those groups under the Ku Klux Klan ideological banner, uh, but this can just be seen as being any group that affiliates itself with the KKK's ideology. So looking specifically at white nationalist groups, here we can see the rapid growth of these organizations in just a really short time period. Um, the two groups with the greatest membership, the American Identity Movement and the Patriot Front, were both formed just in this study uh, period itself, 2016 and 2017 respectively. So you can really see the expansion just in those three years of white nationalist groups. Here's a standalone map of established white nationalist group branches that didn't exist in 2016. This is as of 2019. So just gives you a sense of how recent and nationwide this boom in membership is. So here's some group trends by ideology over these years. Uh, what stands out, just getting a broad sense of this is both the fact, as I mentioned before, that Ku Klux Klan group, group, branch, uh, group branches were uh, half of what they were in 2019 from 2016. We also saw nearly a tripling in white nationalist group branches from 2016 to 2019. One organization that I highlighted was the Proud Boys, uh, who have of course developed an infamous reputation in the news headlines over the last year, especially around the 2020 election and the events of January 6th. Um, they're self-described Western chauvinists um, who have uh, whose group members are known both officially and unofficially for um, anti-Muslim sentiment, as well as misogyny and street violence against other groups. Um, several were linked um, and uh, charged with um, organizing some of the events on January 6th. So in just two years, we can see the massive expansion of Proud Boys chapters from just two in 2017, that would be those two blue dots, blue uh, points there, uh, to 44 branches in 2019. So really just an explosion of um, nationwide popularity just in, in two years. So to sum this all up, what I learned through this research was that the far right has been thriving and changing in the digital age. Uh, we've seen historically established extremist groups linked to the KKK lose membership, while organizations who are born on the internet and molded by what we call the alt-right have had a surge in membership. The growth of these groups isn't just confined to one geographic region either, it's really a nationwide boom. Some further research that uh, I would recommend if I were to expand on this would be to look into online only far right communities uh, that don't have those physical chapters that you see. Um, it's really hard to you know, geographically represent growth when it's just an online only community. Um, so you know, those aren't reflected in this analysis, but that would be a, an interesting kind of addendum to do. Uh, it'd also be illuminating to track any trends in violent activity by any of these groups um, with the rise you know, and changing nature of these groups over these years. So I think, I think this data is important because it drives home the fact that these far right organizations are not static and unchanging. They're really gaining nationwide membership and across generations. Um, and I think this has enormous implications for our democracy. Um, so with that, I'll thank you for your time and I'll take any questions.
Thank you, Aaron. Um, interesting presentation, and I agree. It's important to track um, information such as this. I'll also open the floor for any questions. You guys can put it in the chat or you can ask Aaron directly. Aaron, thank you for your presentation. Could you please go back to your second slide? Yeah. Thank you. So I'm I'm kind of wondering as you you looked at this data and the um, uh, different groups emerging in different areas over time. Uh, if if you thought about or considered methods to show um, overall, if we look at the landscape of the United States uh, and and kind of think of these the presence of these organizations as a stack, what that so what? I'm sorry as as a stack of, of those different data layers, um, mm -hmm. what that may look like. Yeah, I, I guess are you meaning like just the fact that a lot of these um, uh, kind of ideologies can kind of have blurred lines between them and and how to kind of get that straight? Is that what you're kind of referring to? Uh, yes, and 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 partially that, but I, I think also the the some of the some of the groups have um, more distinct regional patterns. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's looking at them as an assemblage or trying to quantify their spread as, as an assemblage um, pr provided a, a, a different insight as to where um, variations of these ideologies may be present across the landscape. Yeah, I think that would be kind of fascinating to do. You know, that's why I wanted to look at least a couple of groups, just put a spotlight on them. Um, rather than just painting more broad, you know, ideological and geographic trends. Um, so, you know, I think it'd be interesting to look at some of these, especially like any KKK links groups or white nationalist groups who had more roots in the South. Uh, I guess I'm thinking of, you know, organizations like the League of the South that traditionally had a stronghold in the Deep South, if they've maybe expanded over time, um, you know, or certainly we've seen Kind of what I was talking about with linking any violence incidents with this data. Um, we've seen, you know, maybe what the data doesn't show about um, Proud Boys locations is, um, you know, violent incidents or confrontations or what have you committed by that group. Because um, especially we've seen a lot in like the Pacific Northwest with the Proud Boys in particular, um, where you see more of like a, you know, leftist groups and and uh, Proud Boys kind of. You know, having scuffles in the Pacific Northwest. I think that would be an interesting geographic analysis to do, kind of diving deeper into this data. Um, you know, but this is kind of more of the, um, the, the overall broader trends of kind of far-right extremist groups. Aaron, this is Kevin, just following up on, on Matt's question a little bit. Did you, um... It looked like most of your maps were presenting the locations of these groups. Did you examine variables such as the size of their membership, the socioeconomic characteristics of the areas in which they formed, you know, any of those types of things? Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious about where your analysis portion of this uh, led you, what kind of techniques you might have applied in analyzing the data to draw those conclusions and so forth. Right. Yeah. The unfortunate thing with the Southern Poverty Law Center data is it doesn't have, and a lot of them are, because a lot of these communities, although they'll have physical branch locations, a lot of their following and membership is is online, and it's sort of a loosely, um, you know, assembled groups of people. So there's not really any that I have found yet, anyways, um, comprehensive numbers on on membership, which is why I wanted to focus on chapter locations, which although that doesn't necessarily point to membership, you know, you could have a bunch of small branches, you know, five members here, five members there. Um, I wanted to get more of the sense of 
how broad, um, you know, geographically these groups are spreading, whether they're confined in certain areas or if, you know, because to me at least, um, being able to open a physical chapter location points to having at least a sizable membership in that area that you're going to invest resources to, you know, open a physical branch with local leadership, um, which is why I, I focused on that. But certainly, even though the data isn't maybe out there, um, you can kind of piece it together from different sources um, on membership for some of these groups. Uh, I think it could be done with some of the larger ones like the Proud Boys. Yeah, I believe, and thanks for answering that, Aaron. I believe there was one in the chat. Um, wasn't a requirement of the competition, you know, that they applied the, oh, okay. So I'm seeing that is from Kevin, okay. All right, so thank you, Aaron. I, I believe just, you know, in the interest of time, we can move on to the next presenter and, you know, further questions can be answered in the chat as well. Um, Robert Abujel, uh, hopefully I got that right. Uh, close enough. Um, here, uh, Robert Abigail. Okay. And great. let me just pull it up. And then let's go to beginning. Okay. So my name is Robert Abigail, and I'm here to talk to you about finding a finding and classifying swimming pools in Staten Island, New York, and then looking at their impact on sales value. Um, thank you for having me. I'm a longtime fan, first time contributor to the UC Young Professionals Cabinet. And I'm gonna be going through why I went through this project of finding every swimming pool in Staten Island, how I did it, and my findings. So the overall question that I'm answering is, if you have a single family house, should you buy that pool in the back or not? So Staten Island is one of the five boroughs of New York City, and it's a mostly residential uh, back uh, bedroom community for the rest of New York City. Um, it has a population of about half a million, while New York City has 8 million population. Homeowners are 69% of the population with 39% of compared to New York City. And the medium household income is 79,000 compared to 63,000 for the rest of the city. And homes in Staten Island are cheaper, regularly about 500,000 compared to 700,000 in all the other boroughs. So what got me interested in this is I'm an assistant tax assessor for the city while doing my master's of geography at Hunter College. And one of the first projects as being a city assessor was they sent, we have to go, have to go, go into the field and actually look at how many are the houses actually there. A city assessor has to stand in front of every property in New York City to prove that it's at that location. But while doing this, they want us to take notes of are there swimming pools and aren't there swimming pools. Doing this, I realized noting down on my notebook that if there was a pool or not a pool, there must be a better method to doing this. And the city of New York only considers swimming pools real property if they're in ground because above ground pools are considered chattel property. They're not taxable because they can be removed in less than 24 hours while in ground pool, you shouldn't. So this is why I started going into this. And then, so it's finding and classifying each of these swimming pools. So first I, it's like, why are swimming pools important? Why does the city need to know if there are swimming pools or not? So on Staten Island, there are 63,000 single family homes and about 6,000 have above ground swimming pools and about 6,000 have in ground swimming pools on Staten Island. So 20% of the homes on Staten Island have swimming pools. And this leads to an impact. There's pu public health impact. Like, do children know how to swim? There's a danger. There's environmental impact. Where does all this water go? Are we using this water as well as possible? And swimming pools, above ground swimming pools are not regulated really in any way, unless there's a disaster and it's too big. 
but the city has no registry of how many above ground swimming pools there are. So I was trying to answer this question. And the, the way I was doing this is first, what are swimming pools? They're water. So how do I find water using remote sensing? I use NDWI. And then how do I differentiate above ground swimming pools from in ground swimming pools? I use height. I get height data from LIDAR. And then how do I know who owns, is this pool a lake or is it in someone's yard? So I use the assessor map, the digital tax map to be able to put these rasters in these maps. And I did this doing NDWI, which I based it off of NIP data. And then I created a digital surface using the NYC LIDAR capture from 2015. I was able to combine those two using a decision tree. And then after I created that raster, I used a tabular count to count the number of pixels of above ground and above ground pool pixels and in ground pool pixels for a tax lot and whatever was greatest I kept. And then I did data analysis. So I pulled in census data and sales data to be able to put in how much the, how much money those things cost. So starting off with NDWI, which is normalized board distribution. So I was able to take the the green band data and then the near infrared and then combining them together with the NDWI, I was able to create the NDWI index, which lit up all the swimming pools. So you can see each of the single family houses and that many of them have a highlighted water in their backyard. Interesting thing is above in ground swimming pools tend to be square and above ground swimming pools tend to be circles. Okay, so now I have all the water, all the pools, but are they in-ground or above-ground? So I use, I create a NDSM to find the height of everything. Okay, so then I use the DSM to create the surface and I subtract that from the DEM, which is the bearer. So I create the NDSM to get the height. So then you can see all the homes, which is the same image, along with the trees. So this is the height. And then I combine these together using a decision tree. So I use NDD of ND, NDWI to find where there's water. And then the first step is to remove like the high water because chances are most of these homes don't have swimming pools on their roofs. So if the water is above five feet, then they're not swimming pools. And then the, it's classified, is it higher than is it between six inches and five feet, then it's an above ground swimming pool. And if it's lower, then it's an in ground swimming pool. So this is what the pixel classifier looks like, is that each of these pools are groupings of pixels and some of them are mixed. And if they're mixed, I use a tabular count to count the number of pixels that fall within each of the tax parcels. And whichever one is greatest is classified as a in-ground, as a tax law having an in-ground pool or an above-ground pool. So you can see that, that this is an above-ground pool, but it has some pixels that say it's in-ground. But since the majority are above-ground, it's classified as above-ground. And then data analysis. So now I have all these tax parcels that have information of if they're an in-ground pool or above-ground pool. And I take the annualized sales data from 2015 and see if there's an impact on their market value. And looking at this, this is the distribution of in-ground pools versus above-ground pools. So in-ground pools have higher values of uh, they're worth more. So this is um, sales price over sales price per square foot. And above-ground pools, uh, I mixed the, the legend up. But above-ground pools, the larger your house, the more making your house larger is only worth it over time. And that only worth it so much. So those values go down. Okay. And then, so then I ended up grouping it by, I took those and aggregated it. So I was able to find it by certain neighborhoods had higher values for in-ground pools versus above-ground pools. And oops, where? Cool. And then, yeah, future research would look at different neighborhoods and are there culture group impacts and to run the same study on Queens. 
my findings is if you want to build a swarming pool, it doesn't necessarily impact your home in a negative value or positive value. And about 10% of homes in New York City have swimming pools. Uh, thank you. And here's the location of the online, it's all Jupyter Notebook and uh, GitHub and everything. So you can explore that data. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. Um, but I'll even encourage you to put that link in the chat if it's possible. Oh, possible. sure. Yeah, I can do that. And any questions? I'm opening for lots of questions. Don't think we have any. Um, so thanks again, Robert. Um, All right, thank you. I guess we can move on to the next uh, presenter. Uh, yes. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, okay, you're at. Okay, so respect to this, uh, I'm extremely sorry that uh, my laptop was not working and I just got disconnected. So uh, like, uh, can I present again at the end of the, um, this, uh, can I present again at the end? Or like there are any questions? I'm extremely okay. sorry for this. Okay, then no problem, Raj. Um, the persons will put in the chat. And, I mean, you can answer any day if you are still seeing the questions. Um, if not, you know, I'll, we'll ensure those are passed on. Um, I guess we can move to the next presenter. I'll introduce Vinaya Thakur. Um, I hope I got yeah. that correct. Yeah. Are you able to share? Yes, yes. Go okay, ahead. great. So are you able to see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Okay. Uh, so hello, I'm Vinaya Thakur from SEPT University, India. Uh, I'm third semester, I'm in third semester of my master program. And this is the part of second semester studio. So I hope this is visible, right? Or just give me a minute. Okay. Uh, so this project is about how we can use GIS for governance. And aim of the project is designing specially integrated decision making support system for emergency response, uh, Gandhinagar city, which is in Gujarat state of India. Uh, government plays an important role in emergency response and services. It is their job to address the risk and also prepare as well as rebuild community after incidences. Thus the aim of emergency response system is to preserve life, prevent situation and promote recovery. I have created an analysis toolbox to address emergency and design a response system using ArcGIS and Python. Uh, this toolkit can become a model and help any city to plan and design its emergency response system. Uh, so before carrying out any analysis, it is important to understand the profile of the city. As per Gandhinagar Municipal Corporation document, the average elevation of the Gandhinagar is 81 meter. Thus, the area below 81 meters are considered as low lying areas. Uh, in case of Gandhinagar city, roads are the primary means of providing any emergency response. Hence, understanding topography, building and population density, road network, and land use land cover is utmost importance. Next is um, hazard analysis. So I have identified areas which are prone to disaster uh, for which I have used weather conditions such as temperature, rainfall and air quality as these can act as a barriers and can compromise the efficient service delivery. Further, the location of past incidences would also help, help in identifying uh, accident prone areas. So they are also marked. Uh, next is capacity analysis. It aims at identifying critical facilities and carrying out their service area analysis and understanding the uh, spatial distribution. This plays a central role by ensuring that the disruption of public services is minimized. Uh, this includes school, colleges, hospitals, fire hydrants, hotel, community centers, blood banks, etc. Uh, 
This slide shows the reach of the uh, services in the city. Uh, next is prioritization of incidents uh, is carried out on the basis of following characteristics that is uh, probability, frequency, ur urgency, Im uh, impact area and human impact for the selected five incidences. And for the purpose of vulnerability analysis, I have identified few criteria for uh, each incident. Uh, so here, with the help of hazard analysis and vulnerability analysis, I have created a risk map. From this map, we can uh, say that there are three sectors which comes under the high risk area. And this also implies that the 9% of Gandhinagar and 11% of its population are at high risk. Um, next is mitigation and response. So ambulance and first responders are crucial in case of emergencies. Thus, the shortest route analysis between high-risk areas to the hospital in safe areas is carried out. Waterlogging is the seasonal issue uh, in Gandhinagar. So, waterlogged areas are considered as a barrier. The graph here is shows the difference between the time taken with and without barriers. From these maps, we can infer that routes of Gandhinagar are seamlessly planned and police stations are strategically placed. Uh, next is for recovery. Uh, for recovery uh, in India, usually government school buildings are converted into vaccination centers or emergency shelters. So considering these government schools in very low risk areas are identified, further route analysis between the identified building uh, is done in case of shifting uh, the resources uh, and, or people in case of emergency and waterlogged areas are considered as a barrier. After shifting, uh, after shifting these, uh, shifting to the emergency centers, the closest facilities nearby to serve the relocated population is also identified and location allocation of ATMs, banks, blood banks and hospitals is carried out. So uh, concluding that the results acquired from the model uh, this model created will help planners and engineers to design and plan emergency response for any city in an efficient manner. Thank you so much. Thank you for now. Um, I open the floor now to any questions. Persons can put in the chat or ask directly. Okay. If I have time, I can, uh, can I share one small video of my dashboard? Is okay, it? sure. Yeah. So, uh, I have created this dashboard and uh, the, the results of the tools which I've generated from ArcGIS is attached to this, uh, this particular dashboard. So this is the The results are, uh, you know, the results are uh, uh, linked to this dashboard. That's it. Okay, great. And um, if you have a link to these tools, you can, you know, feel free to share in the chat. Just make sure it's shared. I believe with everyone, someone sent it to me directly. So uh, even the judges can in view, although they should be able to see. But um, guys, any other questions or if any, you can ask if not i guess we can move on to so, a question ah, um, okay. <laughs> um uh appreciated the the uh, the organization of your presentation and wow there are certainly a lot of maps that that, that you made in uh, in explaining um what was going on in the inputs of the models and, and the outputs of them um, and one of the challenges that, that I often see is making one map is hard, making a good map series uh, is uh, 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 probably the difficulty of one times the, the factor of, uh, of how many maps uh, you have in the series. 
So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your process, um, because it seemed like all those maps had kind of the same layout, the same organization, a, a similar color scheme. Um, how, how did you work through options to come up with that same looking map that would work for all the different maps that you made? Uh, sir, thanks to ArcGIS Pro, I have created, generated this maps in ArcGIS Pro software. And uh, uh, just a second, I, I am sharing my screen again. So, uh, so this is the layout. Uh, I have, uh, I mean, I have did this presentation using the layout feature, uh, which is an ArcGIS Pro software. So, and uh, the, uh, about the color scheme, all the uh, this project explain about the emergency services. So the dark areas represent the high risk uh, areas or something, and the um, light color areas, low uh, risk areas. Light color implies the low risk areas. That is how I created the map. That is that is why it looks more or less similar. I have a there. I have a lot of questions, but I'm going to keep it just to one. Um, you should very briefly, and I, I would very much like to explore your uh, dashboard. Uh, you showed that dashboard. Is that designed to show change over time? So for example, were someone in the community interested in seeing how decisions that they make to make a community more resilient impacts the community? Is the data that you have informing that tool is that live? Is that is it a static snapshot? Is it intended to be something dynamic, or uh, you know, have you thought that far? Uh, no, sir. Um, till now, I uh, I didn't uh, do that. I didn't attach any live data to it. Uh, till now, what I did was uh, I've attached uh, whatever I have generated uh, while do doing this analysis. So. No, and there are some dummy data, uh, the data which I couldn't get from the government uh, that I generated from my site. And so uh, the dashboard didn't have any live data sort of thing, but definitely I'll work on it if I get the data from uh, authorized source. Okay. Um, I have a question about the visuals, the artwork in your presentation. Did you um, create those? yourself? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, I did all this carefully. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Uh, thanks again, Nafia. Um, I guess we can move on to Novinia, sorry. Um, I guess we can move on to our next presenter, Navia Tripathi. Yes, thank you. I will share my screen. Okay. Um, I just wanted to make sure, can everybody see my screen before I start? Yes, yes we can. Okay. My name is Navid Arpati and I go to Buholtz High School in Florida. And my study is a continuation of a past research which I presented at the LEPH conference earlier this year. And I will be discussing the spatial concurrence of the deaths due to COVID-19 and drug overdose in the United States. Thank you so much for the opportunity to present. Before we get into the actual study, I think it's important to look into some current headlines which have shown that drug overdose deaths, which were already a previous issue in the United States and were declared an epidemic by the White House, have been exacerbated during the pandemic and have also increased over 300% since 2000 and 144% in the last decade. What's most important to note, in my opinion, is that in 2019, drug overdose deaths were, seven, were in, uh, increased 7% 7 from 2018, whereas in 2020, they were increased 29% from 2019, which is about four times more increase than the previous year. 
So my study aimed to answer these three questions of identifying hotspots of drug overdose mortalities and COVID-19 mortalities, determining if there was a significant increase in drug overdose mortalities during the COVID-19 pandemic in the US, as well as determining if there's any spatial correlation between mortalities due to drug overdose and COVID-19 in the US. And just for future reference, I may refer to the term drug overdose mortalities as DOM, but I just wanted to say that beforehand. My data came from CDC Wonder, US Census, and Esri, and my software was, was ArcGIS Pro and Microsoft Office Tools. My previous research has shown that California, Florida, Pennsylvania, Ohio, New York, and Texas were among the top six states for DOM from 2010 to 2017. And it's reasonable to assume that that would have been consistent in 2018 and 2019 before COVID-19. And this is also based off of the total number of deaths, not the crude rate. And white males between the age groups of 25 to 54 showed the highest DOM rates. This graph shows the overdose deaths and the COVID-19 deaths on a crude level side by side in the year of 2020. And we can see that overall overdose deaths in each locale have surpassed COVID deaths significantly. And certain locales to keep in mind going forward would be District of Columbia and West Virginia, as well as um, Maryland and Ohio are also notable ones, which we'll see going forward. So if we look at these maps, which show the percent change in DOM from one month in 2019 to the same month in 2020, we can notice how most states are colored, which showed a positive increase in DOM rates. And what's most important to note is the scale. So in these first six months, we see an upper limit of about 57 in the 50s range, generally, and a negative change in the about 20s range and towards the end, it goes down to the 10, 10% range. But in the next six months of 2020 to 2019, we can see that the percent change starting August on the upper uh, end has gone consistently in the 80s and uh, most states are showing much higher percent increases and much lower percent decreases, if any, in the states that have percent decreases. As you can see, the lowest limit, whereas first we saw 21%, is now below 10%, and in November and December comes back to a 21 to 15%, but overall is much less than it was previously. So if we look at this graph of the COVID-9, of, sorry, DOM distributed throughout um, the country um, per month, we can see that with each color representing a month, the bars are pretty evenly distributed between each month, showing that overall DOM happened consistently in each month, about the same rate in each month. And the top 10 locales show DC and West Virginia, as well as Ohio and Maryland, which we had previously noted as well. If we look at similar data, but for COVID-19, we don't see any of that uh, consistency, which we had observed in the previous graph. Here, there are different rates in each month, depending on uh, when those areas were affected by COVID, as well as uh, rallies, protests, mask mandates, and overall COVID policies. For example, New Jersey, New York City, and New York, which are right here, they have long orange bars, and orange represents April, which, and we know that that's accurate since uh, the U.S. was hit by COVID in the Northeast first in, in around April, whereas we know there's uh, there was a bike rally in the Dakota region, and those have long gray bars, which represent months later in the year. So overall, COVID-19 was not consistent in the rates per month, uh, like drug overdose deaths were. So now to do the hotspot analysis of drug and COVID-19 mortalities, we see that drug overdose mortalities in March were concentrated in the Northeast and there were so far no COVID-19 mortalities in the US in March. Going forward in April, we see that both DOM and COVID-19 have 
uh, mortality is concentrated in the Northeast. The same thing in May. Uh, DOM is consistent in June, but in, in the COVID-19 uh, map, sorry, we can see that uh, COVID-19 mortalities are lessening in the North as a hotspot, not necessarily lessening, but not a hotspot in the Northeast anymore. Come July, we can see that the COVID-19 mortality hotspot has completely shifted to the South, whereas the overdose mortalities has stayed consistent. The same trend as July continuing. And now in August, uh, October, we can see how the COVID-19 mortalities have shifted up to the North, whereas DOM is consistent. You can observe the same thing in November and December. And to conclude, we can say that drug overdose deaths increased regardless of what was happening with COVID-19 death rates. And there was a spatial correlation between drug overdose mortalities and COVID-19 mortalities, but only in the months of March to June, which was before when we saw how COVID-19 mortality shifted south and then back north. And also three of the top 10 locales with the highest drug overdose mortality rates also had high COVID-19 mortality rates. So those answer our three research questions. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Thanks, Navia. Um, Thank you. Open the floor now, guys. Anyone has any questions? Hi, Navia. Um, this is Meredith. I have a question for you about um, the rates of death. For your, and I apologize if I missed this, but were you calculating those as rates per population or were those um, just as raw counts. Okay, so most of everything that I did here was crude uh, death rates, which I calculated as the number of deaths due to either DOM or COVID divided by population times 100,000. So it was per 100,000 people in the area. Um, the only thing that did not have rates and just had totals was um, one of my initial slides, which I can show you. It was this one right here. These are total deaths, the top six states. Everything else is crude death rates. I hope that answers the question. I'm sorry if I misinterpreted. It did, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? I wanted to jump in. Um, I feel like I've watched you grow up <laughs> over the years. Uh, the, I think the first time you presented at a ERISA conference was in eighth grade. Was that correct? Yes, Miss Wendy, that's correct. Oh, you are amazing. Keep up the awesome work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, and I think Wendy had put in the chat, um, Navi is in high school, guys. So this is <laughs> some really good Navi, I just, just a real quick question. I and and I, I I echo Wendy. By the way, I'm I am very impressed uh, you. Th that you would do this type of work. I, I'm just curious what uh, tweaked your interest about the relationship between COVID deaths and overdose. Um, it's this has actually been an ongoing project of mine for the past few years. Um, in 2019, I presented in a conference, in the URISA conference, about just drug overdose deaths from 2010 to 2017. And I think the next year, yeah, 2020 was the onset of COVID-19 in the US. And that's when I started seeing all the headlines about how drug overdose deaths were going through the roof with the COVID-19 pandemic. And I thought I could do the spatial analysis and see if that was true or if it was just something that was happening alongside, but not really affected together. So that's why I thought I'd do that. I, I, I commend your high school. If it, Did you learn the techniques that you used in the classroom or were these things that you learned on your own? I learned this on my own. Initiative is a great thing. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Okay. Um... Well, if there aren't any other questions, thank you again, Navia. Thank you. Um, and I'll move on to our final presenter. Uh, apologies again, uh, it's a challenging name, but Euphrasia Bianca Diatmiko. Um, yes, okay. Euphrasia. I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. 
Yeah, I hope it's there already. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, the opportunity for me here to present about my GIS work uh, titled Intelligent Weather Forecasting and Alerting. I'm Euphrasia. I'm from Indonesia. Uh, weather is actually an essential component of daily operations in natural resources industries, such as um, plantation, forestry, agriculture, mining, oil, gas, and so on. Uh, but certain weather conditions actually could affect these industries to stop their operational activities. For example, during the rainy days, uh, mining transportation should be postponed regarding the fleet safety as the excessive rainfall uh, could result in slippery dirt roads and also mud areas at mining sites. But this then um, further pushes back their work timeline and it results also in significant costs because of those delays. So natural resources industries need an adequate weather information system to uh, help them organizing operational activities for scheduling and time management for situation, uh, situational awareness and also adaptation uh, through decision making to achieve their daily targets. So uh, this project results in an integrated solution, which is called as intelligent weather forecasting and alerting. Uh, the system provides comprehensive current weather information in real time. Uh, it also provides insightful weather trend and certain time ranges. Uh, it also provides the forecast at several defined locations of natural resources industries in Indonesia. Uh, also with the forecast at district and city level for a national extent. Uh, all this information are only in one visualization dashboard. And furthermore, uh, it also supports the notification and alerting of weather information to the users, uh, to email and also social media. So the workflow involved in this project um, are the crawling and pre-processing data in Python for two uh, weather data sources, which are from Indonesian governmental agency uh, for climate and weather in XML format. And the other one is from uh, open weather in JSON format. This uh, data uh, are actually updated regularly using ArcGIS API for Python. Uh, two uh, feature services published in ArcGIS online and all this information are uh, visualized in a real-time dashboard for weather monitoring. Other data sets uh, such as ESRI's Living Atlas, also other data from Indonesian governmental agency for uh, climate and uh, weather, and also from NASA are uh, added for the visualization of the dashboard. And all the uh, weather updates, the dashboard, uh, are informed to the users in real time automatically um, as notification to email, to Telegram channel, and also Twitter. So uh, the outputs of this project are compiled in one single uh, link. And each of the points uh, on the map actually represents the nature industry's location. Uh, in Indonesia with its attribute and uh, as classified into three different types of uh, natural resources industries on the right and the temporal information is shown on the uh, bottom left for each hour. Uh, each point has its own attribute and uh, for the current and forecast uh, of the weather and we can see also the graphs uh, displaying the uh, several weather elements. And all this information is updated to a uh, Telegram channel and the same information is also shared to email together with the link of the dashboard. And uh, at the end of the uh, workflow here, uh, the system is triggered automatically to post all this information to Twitter in real time. So natural resources industries could gain several uh, added values to their business. The first one is to maintain their work safety. Uh, the second one is to improve their productivity and planning. The next one is to avoid unexpected operational costs and also leverage effective time management. Thank you.
Okay, thanks, Patricia. Um, I open the floor now for any questions. This is Kevin. Um, very impressive dashboard. Uh, is this being used uh, by any stakeholders currently? You mentioned the real-time nature of it. Yes, currently, yes, uh, by several uh, plantation industries. I hope and, that's good. And can you talk perhaps a little bit to how you applied analytical techniques in this? <clears throat> yeah. Uh, I actually executed some uh, statistical and also spatial analytics here. The spatial one actually involves the uh, intersection between those several defined locations of natural resources industries, uh, the intersection between that and also the, um, the boundary of the data. So boundary of the data from uh, Indonesian governmental agency for climate, uh, that's based on the district level and uh, yeah, that's that's the lowest one, and also the city level. So basically, I match between those locations, and I extract the weather information between those. Uh, there are actually some other special uh, analyses here. Uh, I put that on the uh, workflow using ArcGIS API for Python. I use uh, several Python libraries which support special analyses. I hope that's clear. Well, that was very helpful. Um... Thank have you. you done have you done any um you mentioned the, i mean this is a weather forecasting dashboard have you done any validation to see how closely it approximates what actually occurs okay uh actually because i use the existing data and these data sets are from reliable sources or let's say um like a reliable stakeholders in indonesia i didn't do checking uh for those locations and also that data uh, but the data itself from that uh, governmental institution and also from the open weather, they have that uh, accuracy information uh, on their website. So uh, I just referred to that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Kevin. Um, any other questions? If no other questions, um, someone is saying something. Okay. Well, uh, thanks again. Okay. Thanks again, Euphrasia. Um, now I, I want to open the floor. I want to firstly thank everyone for their presentations and sharing their work. Um, the judges for being here and all, all, all the participants. Um, we open the floor now to any other questions you guys would have for any of the presenters um, with regards to the logistics or anything they have done with the data or will do. Um, afterwards, also, we would like to encourage the judges to remain back just for a few if you have any questions for us um, organizers. Josiah, this is Kevin. I, you know, on behalf of your I just want to thank all of the presenters for the work that they did. This is impressive work um, across the board and you know the efforts are appreciated. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah. Thank you for sharing it with us today. Okay, and I see some links are, uh, are being uh, sent in the chat, et cetera. So you guys can check out some of the work um, that has been shared here today. So, I mean, if no other questions or, you know, comments, uh, again, thank you guys. We really appreciate you guys participating, you know, in the digital competition um, and, you know, taking the time out to come here and share your work with us. And, you know, we wish you all the best. I believe the winners, um, Megan, you can correct me, would be announced August 31st. Yes, we will announce um, by August 31st, I think, via press release, and we'll also contact you um, personally <laughs> as well. Okay, guys. So you guys can look out for that information. Um, so thanks, everyone, for being here. And we wish you, you know, a great week, rest of the day. And I encourage the judges to just stay back for a quick second. <laughs>